And I'm also, <laughs> uh, we're continuing right away with Maria Cristina Franco Ferraz, uh, who will speak about the politics of rumination in times of hyperconnected dispersion. And Maria Cristina has a master from the PUCI in Rio de Janeiro and a PhD from the Sorbonne University in Paris. Um, and she's a professor of communication theory at the Federal University of Rio. Uh, she's author of many books. Um, and uh, among them, Ruminations, uh, or Ruminasos, Cultura Letrada e Dispersao Hiperconectada from 2015. And I'm sure we will hear more about your research also for that book now. Thank you. Bom, boa tarde. Good afternoon. I'd like to first of all thank Stephanie and to thank Graham Burnett and Gabriel Perez Barreiro for the invitation. You'll see that I'm going to talk in a more uh, philosophical way, and this is my topic. I'm going to do more of a diagnosis of the contemporary situation, and my speech is going to have to do with the bad feeling that we have nowadays with a feeling of asphyxiation, and I wish to open up space for you to breathe deeply, and this for me is the same as thinking together and in presence. And to begin, I'm going to cite George Ogambi in the book Nudity, and I hope that it is the symbol of my speech. I can't pass, I can't seem to pass the slide. Okay. So this is the snippet that I would like to begin with. Contemporary is the one that receives at their face part of the evil that comes from their time. It's as if the invisible light that is the darkness of the present projects itself on the shadow over the past and in the present, touching the snippet of shadow and acquires the capacity to answer to the evil that we live now. So some aspects of this evil that we live now, some contemporary thinkers have been talking about the constant state of dispersion and the diffuse regimen that we live in, multiple tasking that affects mostly urban societies and advanced societies and emerging ones. The everyday experience has shown that it's been difficult to concentrate attention. If you are a professor or a researcher, you know this, especially when we are in election periods, to dedicate yourself in a deep, concentrated way in ideas and books. It seems more and more rare to be able to sustain desire in time. It's on this regards that I'd like to talk to you. Why? Because the regime of dispersion that's hyper-connected is connected to the distance between the bodies that would be affected in presence and would be available to encounters and events. We insert a time period in the time to what we can call the literate culture or philosophy. We're not ex talking about lamenting the state of things, but thinking the implications that it has and problematizing them. Going back to Gumbin, to illuminate some of its dark strands, all, always talking about the marketing corporation aspects. At this moment, the lettered culture, the, the literate culture will be activated. These phenomena of dispersed hyperaction is not simply action and effect. It's not only caused by the dissemination of digital aspects and information. This would be to simplify it too much, going back to the commercialization and, and expansion of technological gadgets, although they do produce ways of life and times that are adequate to expensive regions to the capital. These regions, which we could associate to 
again citing Jonathan Burden as online, nonstop, and on demand. What's at play here is the adequation or compatibilization of the bodies and subjectiveness, the demands of the f frenetic flows, a flexible and that slide of capital and work and labor. Jonathan Crary has been investigating the process of progressive dispersion of attention and capturing of the attention and the ability of continuity and discontinuity from the 19th century on. His work on the genealogy about the perception and subjectiveness of the human being enriched the discussion about capturing and modulate attention in the non-stop online life that will for sure intensify itself during this century due to the dissemination of what we call Internet of Things, not only cell phones, but eyeglasses and cars will start to incentivate connectivity, contributing to the end of connectivity and the time that we live in. Now I'm going to cite Jonathan Crary, 27.4, because to me he is top of the notch person about the topic on attention. So the book is 24 bar 7. He talks about the new frontier to be colonized on the logic of capital and the life with a value in the entrepreneurship. His ultra competitive values, this last frontier is our dream. It has to do with a research financed by the Pentagon about migratory birds that can stay without sleeping for many days without ever losing track of their path. These are migra migratory birds. As you know, it's not useless. It's This is the reason why the Pentagon studies, because during war, states of fatigue and the need to rest represent a problem to be overcome. All we have to do is remember that in the Second World War, amph amphetamines were used to keep the soldiers alert. Nonetheless, these pharmaceuticals, although they kept them from sleep, didn't solve the problem as a whole because they couldn't keep the efficiency of the actions and decision taking. So these research that the Pentagon is undertaking does not keep them are not do not seek to keep them from sleeping. They're studying biological mechanisms present in the brain of certain migratory birds that allow for the person the being can keep from sleeping or resting without having their their actions diminished. This is to be placed then back in the civil society in regimes that are highly competitive in high performance demands and the omnipresent demand so that we can compartmentize the human body with its limitations and fluctuations as we've spoken about before about the regimes of attention. And one of the things that have to be corrected is the need for rest and sleep. Nietzsche would say of healthy forgetfulness. The mobilization of multitasking bodies, which are ours, bodies that are able to change focus at any given moment, was also object of reflection of the Portuguese philosopher José Gil, who also dedicated to dance and arts. Zhu says that the frenetic circulation, both physical and digital, of the illusion of movement, of freedom, of a broad and rich spectrum of desire. Nonetheless, a simple hop from one thing to another, may it be a human relationship or a task, has a dispersion effect. Usually, they only simulate experiences which is something that has already been touched on today. And in its accelerated 
change end up stopping, creating a barrier for the circulation. So I'd also like to talk about this present framework and a little bit of the links that have been breaking. This is connected to a continuous sliding in smooth surfaces, keeping from events in the body to happen. Sliding on surfaces without any type of adherence remembers us a uh, material that is in our everyday life, Teflon. Among us, it's called Tefal. We remember how it was to fry an egg before Teflon, that difficult task between the organic and inorganic. But after Teflon, inorganic and organic simply slide. And Teflon is meaningful because it has two characteristics, which I believe have to do with what we are becoming, maybe. It is a material with the lowest coefficient of friction. We've been talking about friction and the erosion of friction and a higher level of impermeability. So the lack of friction and impermeability. The inorganic Teflon expresses the sliding surfaces that we are to become, surfaces that nothing attaches to. Plates that slide, that have such a thin layer that is both sliding and waterproof or a barrier. In this situation, bodies do not affect each other, which makes it more difficult or makes it totally impossible for the feeling of continuity. We also have this continuous false idea of liberty. Liberty connected to the false idea because it keeps nothing and it will become totally proofed to any type of relationship. And this will become the new imperative as coercion. Nicole Rhodes talks about this, the imperative of liberty. To this, we add the emphasis on individual success, which feeds the imperative of happiness connected to the idea of personal empowerment and self-esteem. We are again talking about imprisoning in the open space since the 90s by Deleuze with the idea of control. This liberty is associated nowadays to the accelerated way of life and derooting with an elevated level of autonomy. The free body circulating without any type of ties or traditional ties, always skipping and hopping in constant transit from to nowhere, starts closing in it's sensitive and relationship-wise. And this because of a type of lack between the bodies and its closing. Closing of the poreness. I'd like to talk about the pores of this membrane of, as an interface within and outside our skin. Our skin is our largest organ and the way we communicate by excellence. And it is porous. It's not closed. So we constitute a type of uh, arc arcabas evolving in this smooth environment without any rules, closed within itself and isolated. And then I cite again José Ju. It is the effective body that is emptied. The space of circulating is available and deliberately also, but it's lost quality. The singularity and the opening. It's not a space of possibles, but the circulation of zombies. That's uh, Maybe that's one of the reasons we've been seeing so many movies and series with zombies. The skin that we believe to have been closed and keep our bodies within has a paradoxical stature. It is a true interface within and without. It is a membrane of transit and exchange with what we call environment. It's not just a wrapping. Your skin does not end where we see it as a type of of line or closing isolation. It continues actually much beyond the space which we usually put it. 
when we understand the body in its paradoxical stature, we get the idea from within the body that's radically different from our usual one, an idea from the interior that does not oppose to the external, because this internal is not produced in the continuum with the porous surface of the skin. I will talk again about José Gil. This frontier zone really does have a paradoxical interaction. On one side it is porous, but then it also continues the skin within, giving it a space, transforming it. It's not only sur surface anymore, but volume atmosphere. And I understand that atmosphere, a lot of the contemporary art suggests an opening to these pores. Working with this membrane, which is the interface within and without, this paradoxical dimension, this at surface of exchange is usually set in our perception. These paradoxes of the skin in the Western world have incorporated the idea of individual, which calls for a dialogue within and without that it's been very difficult to escape. In general, we believe that our own bodies would be could be isolated from what is around us, natural and cultural, and would communicate with them from this previous separation. In this idea, it becomes unavoidable that the body be thought and lived as a cut and pushing away from what's within and without as an isolation tape, as the Möbius tape, which is also a figure that has been well elaborated in contemporary art as a means of where the affection forces circulate. The way of circulation and the way they circulate by the logic of control tend to diminish the logic of porousness of the skin. The pressure for connectivity in the non-stop world has a tendency to digitalize the skin, closing its pores in this smooth skin, which is a type of a model that we seek, a skin without any type of cracks, a digitalized skin. And this smooth skin, possible encounters seem to only hit and slide off. It's not only the speed or acceleration, but an incitation to the speed and immediateness of connections and deconnections favoring the forgetfulness and the discardable way in general that's inherent to the programmed obsolescence, which is the logic of production, which means when you buy a computer or cell phone, you know that you're already buying something that's obsolete. So this logic of programmed obsolescence, I think it extends to merchandise relationships and the ways of being. Well, and then we create a short circuit in this continuous sliding that flows in our lives and Berg is going to call duration. When the, skin, the closed skin gets the characteristics of permeability in, such as a Teflon, we try to find ways out. I'm going to remind you that porous means exit. So apodia means no way out. So we are seeking poros in the old Greek sense of exit way out. And then I'm going to talk about the history of porous, which is very curious and is articulated with arrows. The Greek articulated the theme of the exit of situations where you don't see a way out. The Greek articulated the way out with the erotic realm. And here, going back to porous and arrows in the Greek, we could understand the situation. So Poros, a way out, is the son of Matches, the first wife of Zeus. Of course, Zeus eats his first wife because she was he was afraid of her. And then Poros is the one that finds a way out to find alternatives in difficult situations. 
Porus is connected to Eros in the following way, in a very known version of the story and is present in the banquet of Platoon by the, Sars by the Jutin Sarsidotes. Eros would be an intermediate being between the gods and the humans, between Poros, the god, and a human mother. Penea was not in invited for Aphrodite's banquet. So then she makes use of Poros's sleep because he had eaten, drank much, and was sleeping in the garden. And Penea makes advantage of his Poros and engenders Eros. So Eros is the fruit of expedient and poverty. So this connection of this close relationship between Poros and Eros, we can articulate our topics and reinforce a hypothesis, which would be the following. The deep potentialization of the depth of the paradoxal aspects of the body and the blocking of the porousness affects the circulation of errors in the body. This is my largest topic here in Brazil now. The closing of the porousness of the bodies and therefore short circuit in the desire of errors. In this sense, I would like to pose a question that's for sure present for those of you that dedicate yourselves to the field of arts, how to activate the opening of the pores and the intensive forces of arrows in the conditions of dispersion and corrosion of sustaining the desire in time, how can we produce attention in regimes of attention, talking about more porous time? And then I go, I start dialoguing with these issues, referring back to an extemporal thought from Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche had the, in, the intuition the end of the 19th century, tendencies to dispersion that were already installing themselves in European societies at the end of the 19th century. For example, Zarathustra finds a strange character when he leaves his isolation. It's a type of enormous walking ear. Looking better, Zarathustra observes that on the ear there was something, little thing, and he describes it almost as Kafka. This enormous ear was on top of a very small branch, which was actually a man. So on top of the ear, there was a body with an envious face. And this is the curious being, an enormous ear that everything hears and absorbs without filtering. And in an updated version, everything receives and shares with its filtering ability of reflecting and short-circuited. Attentive to the growth and out of proportion years without filtering, it's Nietzsche suggested a philosophy for small ears, which is also a labyrinth. So distant from this modern being as the long ears from the donkey, this animal that also appears for Zaratus and only says ia, ia, which means yes in German. And it's difficult because the donkey is actually yes in German. In other words, we only know here how to be if you click in a mechanic automate automated way, and I believe that the don which donkeys would Nietzsche see in our modern days, making available in a more integral way our precious time of life in a connectivity, continuous way of life without ever ending actions, and that are sold to political projects that pass far away from reflection and arguments, which of course demand time and stiffening of the bodies and of the desire. As opposed to these approaches, Nietzsche refers to the art of reading and interpreting of the thought himself, not to rationality, but to the body, especially to the stomach. 
for Nietzsche, the spirit is the stomach. And that's a metaphor, that's a comparison, it's not an analogy. The spirit is the stomach. If there's any spiritual activity in humans, it's digestion, which is also forgetting. So thinking is about the body in its most spiritual function, not only digesting in human terms, but also chewing and rechewing, ruminating. And then based on that, he chooses bovine digestion as a model for thinking. This obviously requires attention, concentration, and openness to more fluid temporalities. Thinking would equal activating this digestion that requires various stomachs, like in the nutrition or in the feeding process of cows. Nothing like fast food. In this process, new potencies of the body are activated, and that's the proposition. That, that's his bet. Successive stomachs are produced. So we either create another version of what it means to think, or we would have to think of ways to implode the monstrosity of big ears and big eyes with excess immediate perception in favor of, a, of body stiffening that can favor and intensify spirits slash stomachs. I think that's one of the ideas of the biennial. Thinking about Bergson, now Virginia already mentioned him. I'm not going to talk about Bergson much, but uh, briefly. What I would like to say about Bergson is matter and memory, because he thinks about this game between perception and memory, and that's when attention comes into play in a very rich way. Simple example, immediate perception of a door. First, for Bergson, you don't think or you don't perceive anything to learn, but you perceive things to act upon them. That's a, it's a different perspective. But when you're before a door, immediately you have this rough scheme. Your memories come and complete this rough scheme. Then you recognize a door, and therefore you can open it. So our perception usually works based on this scheme. It is more about the past in us that updates itself in favor of present actions. In the sense, the trend is that the similarity will work. When Bergson talks about attention in matter and memory, he is precisely talking about this bodily attitude that you can adopt to interrupt this natural mechanism. With that, you can have a different perception, not based on recognition. You suspend that immediate updating of memories and images in this rough scheme of perception, and you repass the contours of the object, and with that, you expand your memory circuit so that it, because, so that it gets in line with the subtle of work on the differences. I think Bergson elaborated that in 86, and he expanded that into all the perspective of arts in the beginning of the century until today. But mainly the idea of strangeness. It's a suspension of automat automated behaviors in favor of a relationship where something new can come up, not mere, mere updates of the past. With all this mediatic and um, spectacular culture, actually, we are targets of a capture policy, attention capture policy. It's a political game to catch people's attention all the time. But this time, this type of game may hinder the filtering and the concentration. And we tend only to recognize things, meaning project what we know on what's new, or projecting what's familiar on what's not on what's new. Everything seems to combine in this effort for distraction, like pressure for satisfaction, pressure for immediate pleasure. Of course, this uh, panel that I'm outlining, this diagnosis, sounds a bit tragic and catastrophic, but that's the, rh the rhetoric emphasis that I would like to place on it, like all other theoretical approaches. So I'm not regretting or I'm, I'm not feeling sorry about these situations, but I want to discuss them. How and especially for what should we catch people's attention? 
That's the topic of this symposium. Invite them to change body attitudes in this tough fight for attention. So, to conclude, there is another vector that I would like to talk about, which is time. Nietzsche has this interesting elaboration on the temporality of thinking. The idea of bovine digestion, rumination, needs a more dedicated and longer time. And despite that, Nietzsche also appeals to this intense speed, this intensive speed that includes attentive reflection. Nietzsche talks about the, the, his choice for the synthetic form of the aphorisms in much of his production, and he also announces the effect he intends to achieve. In uh, page 257 of this book, he re highlights that the briefness of his aphoristic style requires a type of approach. It requires agile and, and, and fast rhythm like a dancer, like a ballerina. So to deal with deep problems, this is the following method he applies, cold baths. And I'm not talking about cold baths here in the tropics, but cold baths in Germany. In the synthetic expression that the German language enables, in this sentence that he writes in his uh, aphorism, he performs that lively rhythm of thinking. C come in, come out, come in, come out, something like that. So it's worth practicing this paradox, the slowness of rumination combined with the energizing speed of cold baths in cold climates. The warming produced by digestion, by ruminated digestion, prepares the body for the shock of energizing cold baths. Therefore, we would need no historical temporalities to think. Or, like common sense, common sense says in Brazil, stop to think. In Brazil, we always say, we have to stop to think about that or stop and think about it. Uh, Virginia talked about William James. It's not like when the bird lands on a branch. It's not the end of the movement that matters. It is a break in the movement, but during the movement. It's not the end of the movement there. So we can think about moving in this life chaos of the present in the condition of that dispersion, inventing resistant intensities, rumination and cold showers. We're therefore living a favorable moment, a moment that favors thinking. In this cultural landscape, we now understand that common sense is shorter and, and not as comprehensive as we thought it was. In the picture that I tried to outline here with you, this overview, I also intended to be performative somehow, because going against our own disper dispersion, it bet, I, I bet on the power of thinking for a polyphonic understanding of the present. Thank you.